we're now going to discuss how we use a line to separate a plane into two different spaces so that we can talk about things happening on one side of the line or on the other side of the line. It turns out that while this is a very intuitive notion for us, we are actually going to need to introduce an axiom to describe how lines and planes intersect in this way, because it's, it cannot be derived from the axioms that we've had so far. So in order to get into it, we need to start with a preliminary definition. Uh, definition uh, 21 says that a set uh, C, which is a subset of S, our whole space, is called convex if whenever uh, X and, uh, I'm sorry, whenever A and B belong to the set C, the segment AB is a subset of C. So this is a fairly intuitive concept. If we look at a couple of different spaces here, we'll take a space uh, here on the right and a space C, pri uh, C prime on the right, sorry, C on the left. And what we can notice is that if we take any two points inside of the set C and form the segment connecting them, then every point in that segment is going to be a subset of the set C itself. Uh, and therefore, we would say that this set C is convex. On the other hand, if we look at the set C prime, this is not the case. Now, it will be true for certain pairs of points that we take in C prime, but there exist some pairs of points, for instance these two, where the segment containing uh, the two points that we started with as endpoints doesn't lie entirely within C prime. So this set C prime is not uh, convex. Uh, so, uh, convexity, um, a convex set behaves well with respect to the types of structures that we're looking at. So, for instance, you can show that in a convex set, if, a, if you take any three non-collinear points in a convex set, then the triangle that, uh, with those three points as vertices, also is a subset of the set C that you're talking about. And, um many other uh, examples of this as well. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use this concept of convex in order to um, define what we mean by a line separating a plane into two half planes. So we're going to take an axiom and we're going to call this axiom PS1 for plane separation the plane separation postulate. Postulate is just another word. Uh, it's a synonym for axiom. So axiom and postulate, same thing. So it says the following. Given a plane E and a line L, that's a subset of E, there exist uh, subsets H1 and H2, uh, subsets of E, such that uh, three, uh, four things happen. Now, as we run through these, uh, we can take a picture of what's going on and use intuition to understand where all these ideas are coming from. So, we have a plane E, we have a line L, and these two half planes are going to 
be the two sides of the plane that the line has split the plane into. So the first thing is we want to know that H1, H2, and L are pairwise disjoint. That means that no element lies in two of these sets. Any two sets have an empty intersection of the three that we've listed. Uh, second, we have that the whole plane is the union of H1, L, and H2. So every point in the plane lies in one of these three sets. It either lies on the line or in one of the two half planes defined by the line. Number three, H1 and H2 are convex. And number four, and this is the real key one that uh, sort of defines and fixes how our geometry is working together. If some point P lies in H1 and some point Q lies in H2, then the segment PQ and the line L do not have empty intersection. Or in other words, uh, there exists some R, some point R that lies between P and Q and that lies on the line L. So we can see that illustrated in our picture as well. If I've got some point P that lies in H1 and some point Q that lies in H1, H2 rather, and I form the segment with those two points as endpoints, then there's going to be some point R where the segment and the line intersect. Now, there are some technical things that we need to check uh, in order to make this axiom useful as a description for uh, how we split up a plane into two parts using a line that lies in the plane. So for that, we turn to the next lemma. So lemma 22, given a plane uh, E, a line L that's contained in E, uh, and a point P, that's in E, but is not in L. Uh, the two sets, uh, which, we'll, which we'll define here, HP and H prime P. Uh, before I describe them, I'll say uh, what the conclusion is. Are the two half planes Uh, define uh, of E defined by L. So this, when we write down what these sets are, it's going to show us that we can figure out what the two sets H1 and H2 are just with the information of the plane, the line, and some point that's not on the line, basically to distinguish uh, which um, of the two sides we're talking about. So HP, this is going to be the set of all Q that lie in E, all points of the plane, such that the segment PQ intersect L is empty. And HP prime is going to be the set of all Q in E, uh, such that Q is not in L, but the segment PQ intersect L is not empty. We 
call HP the P side of L. So uh, what this is doing is the following. Again, let's draw a picture of what's going on. We've got our plane and we've got our line, which is, uh, which is going through it. So now I can take any point P in the plane. And now I can look at all the points of the plane and I can say, well, first of all, I'm only looking at things that don't lie on the line. And so I can take a few different values of Q. Let me, let me put a few Qs in here. Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, and Q5. Now we can see intuitively based on the picture that the points Q1, Q2, and Q3 lie on the same side of the line L as P, and the points Q3 and Q4 don't. But the point of the lemma is that we can characterize this exactly using the question of whether the segment that goes from P to each of these various Qs intersects the line L or not. So notice that the segment that goes from P to Q1 and the segment that goes from P to Q2 and the segment that goes from P to Q5 all don't intersect with the line L at all. They all stay away from L. On the other hand, if I take the line from P to Q3 or the line from P to Q4, each one of those segments does intersect the line L somewhere. And so what we see is that this makes the left hand or the right hand side, as I've written it, of the plane HP and the right hand side HP prime. Another way of thinking about this and the way that we most often intuitively think about this type of plane separation uh, is the following. So our intuition. Uh, a point, uh, two points, P and Q, are on the same side of L if and only if uh, the segment PQ intersect L is empty. And two points P and Q, um, as long as neither one is on L, are on different sides if and only if the intersection of the segment PQ with L is not empty. So uh, this, is, uh, this is the lemma for, um, for how we understand what's going on. And the proof uh, basically uh, shows that um, every It's a proof of two sets being equal, and, sh and so we show that um, the half planes as defined by the axiom and the half planes as defined by the lemma are equal as sets because the, uh, the sets can be defined perfectly well once by the axiom and once just in the description of the lemma. So let's see how that proof goes. All right, so we want to let E be a plane. I'm just going to copy down some of our uh, context here so that we have it uh, easily at hand. Let E be a plane. L contained in E a line and P in E, uh, but not L. And let's let HP be the set of all points Q in E such that the segment PQ uh, does uh, intersecting L is empty. So the segment PQ does not intersect L. Uh, so that's one of the sets we're looking at. We also know that by PS1, by plane separation one, uh, there exist uh, H1 and H2 Half, uh, that are the half planes of E defined by L. 
So since P uh, is not in L, uh, P is in H1 or P is in H2. Now this point in the proof, there's nothing distinguishing H1 from H2. We haven't associated any sorts of properties with either one of them. They're completely indistinguishable from one another in terms of the proof, except for the labels that we've associated to them. This is precisely the situation where we can just relabel things if we need to, and without loss of generality, we can just go ahead and assume that P was in H1. If it wasn't, then we can just switch the labels, call one of them H1, uh, call the what was H2 H1, and what was H1 H2. Uh, so without loss of generality, uh, let's assume P belongs to H1. So now we want to show that H1 is equal to HP, because H1 is one of the half planes defined by L, that's uh, the definition of it, uh, and HP is the set that the lemma claims is one of the half planes of E defined by L, so we want to show that these two sets are equal. Uh, and we're going to do this using um, uh, using set containment. We're going to show that one of them is uh, that each one is contained uh, in the other two. So first of all, let's let Q belong to H1. We're going to show that H1 is a subset of HP. Uh, so. Uh, since H1 is convex, that was one of our hypotheses, one of, or one of the parts of our axiom, since H1 is convex and P and Q both belong to H1, we have that uh, P, the segment PQ is a subset of H1. Uh, therefore, uh, since H1 intersect L is empty, H1 and L have no points in common, that means that the segment PQ intersect L is also empty. So the segment PQ belongs to H1 as a subset of H1, and H1 contains no elements of L, therefore the segment PQ contains no points in L. Therefore, uh, Q belongs to HP uh, because Q satisfies the condition uh, for, uh, for HP. Uh, so this shows that H1 is a subset of HP. Now let's show the other direction. So now let's let Q belong to HP so that uh, the segment PQ intersect L is, uh, is empty. If Q were to belong to L, then uh, Q would belong to, well, it certainly belongs to the segment PQ, and if Q belonged to L, it would also it would therefore belong to their intersection, uh, but their intersection, by hypothesis, is empty. So this is a contradiction. So Q definitely can't belong to L. If uh, Q belonged to H2, then since... Um, Q, uh, then since P belongs to H1 and Q belongs to H2, uh, that would mean that the segment PQ intersect L would not be empty. That was the other part, and other part, of our axioms. The two half planes have this property that if you take a point in one and a point in the other, then the segment containing them has to intersect the line that separates them. 
But this is also a contradiction. Because we assume that, that Q belongs to HP, uh, which means that the intersection of the segment PQ with L is empty. So what we've shown is that Q can't belong to the line L, uh, Q can't belong to, the, uh, to H2, and therefore Q has to belong to H1. That's the only uh, place left in the plane for it to be, and because every point in the plane lies in one of those three sets, that means that Q has to belong to H1. Therefore, HP is a subset of H1, and we already had that H1 is a subset of HP, so we get that H1 equals HP. So that gets us uh, almost all of what we need, and in fact the rest is, uh, is very simple. Uh, we have that HP, our set HP that we were looking at before, uh, is the half plane as defined by our axiom. Now HP prime, by definition, is the set minus uh, HP and L. But HP is H1. We just worked that out. And if I look at all points in the plane other than H1 and L, well, that's H2. So this shows that this HP prime definition that we came up with before uh, is, in fact, equal to the half plane H2 as defined by the axiom. So this lemma really gives us a very efficient way of going about uh, detecting or using facts about when a point lies on the same side of a line as the other. We're going to uh, continue to talk a lot about points being on the same side of a line or the opposite side of a line. In all cases, there has to be a, a certain plane that you're talking about, because a, a single line belongs to very, very many planes. But uh, we have to be talking about a specific plane and a, and a line contained in it in order to talk about the two half planes. That, however, is most of the situation that we're going to be working in. Most of what we're going to be doing in this course is plane geometry, meaning that most of what we do is going to lie in a single plane anyway. So the concept of being on the same side or on the opposite side turns out to be very powerful. Let's look at a result that we can get out of the plane separation axiom uh, using uh, this lemma 22. So we can look at theorem 23, which is called the Posh postulate. Now, uh, you may uh, be wondering now, why I've called this a postulate, because I said earlier that a postulate is another name for an axiom, but I've labeled this as a theorem, theorem 23, and axioms are not theorems, they're different. And the reason for this is that the posh postulate is the historical name for the result that we're about to look at. And when you're treating separation of planes in geometry, you can do things one of two ways. You can either do it the way that we are doing it, where we take the plane separation axiom, the plane separation postulate that we have just now, and prove the posh postulate afterwards. Or you can do it another way. You can start with the posh postulate, which we're about to write down, and prove the plane separation postulate that we just did. Now, historically, the posh postulate has been, um, has been used perhaps more often than the plane separation postulate that we're using. However, the two of them are completely equivalent, and it's not terribly difficult to prove the plane separation postulate that we have based on the posh postulate, which we're about to write down. So uh, it's historical reasons for why we have this. Uh, so 
the Posh Postulate does have a very nice, um, dis a very nice statement of it. In some ways, a lot cleaner than the uh, plane separation postulate that we were working with. So the Posh Postulate says, given a triangle, A, B, C, and a line L, which is coplanar with triangle ABC. If L intersects the segment AC, then L intersects either the segment AB or the segment BC. The Posh Postulate is easy to illustrate. Let's say we've got a triangle over here, and I'll go ahead and label the, uh, the vertices like this. Let's suppose we've got a triangle ABC, and then we've got some line L that comes in here, and we're told that it intersects the segment um, AC. And what the Posh Postulate says is that once that line has done that, once it's intersected AC, uh, it has to escape the triangle somehow. It either has to escape through the segment BC or it has to escape through the segment AB, but it can't, it can't just stay in there. Uh, it, the Posh Postulate is disallowing some sort of weird geometry where one, uh, once a line gets into the triangle, it's able to just stay in there weirdly somehow. A uh, Posh Postulate says, no, this doesn't happen. And once the line comes through one of the sides of the triangle, it has to go through at least one of the other sides. So let's uh, see how this goes. Uh, and this is not a difficult proof, but it does illustrate the power of using our plane separation ideas very nicely. So for the proof, uh, first of all, notice that if L contains uh, A, B, or C, uh, then it clearly intersects uh, the segment AB or the segment BC. So if the line contains one of the vertices, then it certainly intersects one of AB or BC. Uh, so we can suppose that uh, A, B, and C all do not belong to L. However, the hypothesis of the problem said that A, B, and C are all coplanar with L. There's a single plane that contains all of those elements, those three points and those one line. As soon as we've got a line and a bunch of points, that all lie in the same plane, we can start using our notion of plane separation and being on the same side or the opposite side of the line L. So now let's suppose uh, for contradiction uh, that L intersect the segment AB is empty, that L does not intersect the segment AB, and L intersect BC is empty, that L doesn't intersect BC. This is the opposite of what we're trying to prove, so we're going to try and arrive at a contradiction. Well, that means since L intersect the segment AB is empty, that means that A and B lie on the same side of L because the segment AB doesn't intersect L. And lemma 22 said that that's enough to conclude that A and B lie on the same side of L. Furthermore, B and C lie on the same side of L. 
So if A and B lie on the same side of L, and B and C lie on the same side of L, that means that A and C lie on the same side of L. Lying on the same side of a line is actually an equivalence relation, though we won't prove that explicitly. Uh, but here we're basically using the transitivity of that equivalence relation. So A and C lie on the same side of L, but that means that the segment AC intersect L is empty because A and C lie on the same side of L. But this is a contradiction. What is it a contradiction to? Well, our first hypothesis. Uh, to our hypothesis that L intersects the segment AB. L inter AC. L intersecting the segment AC was an explicit hypothesis that we had at the beginning. And so we have arrived at a conclusion which says that that doesn't happen. Well, that's a contradiction to what we assumed right at the start. So that means that L intersects uh, AB or BC. And uh, so this is an example of the power of talking about things lying on the same side of L or not. And uh, lemma 22 really is sort of key to, to making that connection efficient. Uh, working all this through without using that lemma would be quite complex uh, compared to this. So the posh postulate gives us a really good way of of understanding how lines and triangles interact. And we're going to use this quite a lot throughout uh, the further parts of the course. Next, we want to talk about how other figures that we look at interact with plane separation. Uh, we've already seen some about segments uh, that we can use those to detect uh, things lying on uh, opposite sides or the same side. Uh, we also want to talk about rays. So theorem 24 uh, says, uh, given a line L and a segment AB, or respectively, a ray AB uh, with, uh, with A in L and B not in L, all points of the segment AB, uh, except for A, and respectively, uh, the set of all points of the, uh, the ray AB, except for A, lie on the same side of L. So the picture, again, uh, is intuitive for us. If we've got a line L and we've got, let's say, a ray coming off of L, like this, and we've got a point A and a point B here, then all of the points of the ray, other than the vertex, are going to lie on the same side of L. They're all going to extend off in one direction from L. That's the intuition behind it. Uh, it turns out that um, proving this takes, uh, it, it's a little bit surprising that uh, it takes a little bit of work to do this. So let's look at how we might prove this. Um, uh, first of all, since the segment AB is a subset of the ray AB, uh, we will prove the statement for the ray AB, uh, which will suffice. If we prove that all points of the ray other than A lie on the same side of L, then all points of the segment other than A 
will lie on the same side of L because the segment is a subset of the length. So, uh, let's let C be an element of array AB, uh, but not A and not B. We will show that C is on the B side of L. And so we'll basically show that everything in the ray belongs to the B side of L. So let's let F be a coordinate system for the line AB such that uh, f of a equals 0 and f of b is positive. Uh, now, furthermore, remember that this means that uh, the ray AB consists of all the points with non-negative coordinates. Uh, so, since C belongs to the ray AB, uh, and it's not A, this means that F of C is positive. Uh, so, now, uh, let's suppose there exists uh, some P, uh, uh, we want to show, sorry, we want to show that the segment BC doesn't intersect L. We want to show that the segment CB uh, does not intersect L because that will mean that C and B lie on the same side of L. So suppose, for contradiction, that there exists a P that lies in the segment BC, but also uh, lies in L, which would mean that C is on the opposite side of, um, is either on L or on the opposite side of the line from B. So since um, P belongs to the ray BC, uh, and F of B and F of C are greater than zero. This means that F of P has to be greater than zero. Uh, that me that's because every point in the segment BC has a coordinate that lies somewhere between the coordinates of B and the coordinates of C. So if P belongs to that segment, then that means that its coordinate has to be positive because the coordinates of B and C are both positive. Uh, so in particular, uh, this means that P does not equal A because A is the only element of the line AB which has coordinate zero. Uh, so, uh, but now we have a contradiction. Uh, this means that P is in L, A is in L, uh, both by hypotheses, and P is not equal to A. So that means that uh, we have two different points belonging to L and belonging to the line AB. So that means that the line L has to be the line AP, which is also the line AB. Uh, but this is a contradiction. 
since by, hypo by our hypothesis, B does not lie in L. Uh, so this means that C lies on the B side of L, which finishes, uh, finishes the proof here. So this tells us that if we've got a segment or array that starts on a line and goes off of the line, then all points of that segment array that, uh, except for the, the endpoint on L, lie on the same side of L. We can use plane separation and the notion of these half planes in order to define some other uh, things, such as the interior of angles and the interior of triangles. So definition 25 reads, uh, given an angle BAC, the interior of angle BAC is uh, denoted as int angle BAC, so int for interior, and is defined to be the intersection of the C side of the line AB and the B side of the line AC. So this is the first example where we have uh, talked about half planes defined by two different lines at the same time. So let's look at what this definition says. If I've got my angle BAC, uh, first of all, remember that each of these rays could be extended to lines. And in fact, that's what we need to do in order to understand this definition. So the interior of the angle, first of all, intuitively, it's this area in here. To be precise about it, we need to uh, do the following. We need to take the intersection of the C side of AB and the B side of AC. So the C side of line AB is everything over here on the right-hand side of the line AB. So I'm looking at the line AB. The line AB splits the plane up into two half planes. And then I'm looking at the C side of that line. So the uh, side containing the point C. And that's giving me the red shaded area here. And now I'm going to look at the B side of line AC. So I look at my line AC and I look at the two half planes defined by it and I say, all right, well, here's the half plane that contains the point B on the B side of line AC. And now I've got those two sets, those two half planes, and now I'm going to intersect them, and uh, intersecting them gives me the interior of the angle over here. So it gives us the area that we expect, the part of the plane that we, uh, that we want, but uh, being precise about it requires us to talk about it as an intersection of a couple of different half planes. Furthermore, uh, given triangle ABC, the interior of triangle ABC, uh, denoted uh, int triangle ABC, is defined to be the intersection of the A side of the line BC, the B side 
of the line AC and the C side of the line AB. So to see how this is going, let's get ourselves a triangle. A, B, C. And uh, let's look at what this says. We want the A side of BC. Now let me go ahead and extend all these lines so you can see exactly what's going on. So we're looking at the intersection of the A side of BC, the B side of AC, and the C side of AB. Now if you put all of those together, then what you get is the yellow region in here, which is the interior of the triangle itself. So this is how we will define the interiors of triangles and angles. Uh, these will become uh, relevant to us in the future. Uh, first, a little theorem. Theorem 26, uh, given a triangle ABC, the interior of triangle ABC is convex. Uh, the proof for this is uh, very straightforward, although it does depend on one other result that's, go that's an exercise. Um, by PS1, the plane separation axiom, uh, half planes are convex. Then since the interior of triangle ABC is the intersection of half planes, uh, and the intersection of convex sets is convex. And this is where the exercise is to prove that the intersection of convex sets is convex. Uh, the interior of triangle ABC is convex. So as it turns out, the intersection of any number of convex sets is still a convex set. And since the interior of a triangle is the intersection of three convex sets, then it is convex. We could also have stated by pretty much exactly the same argument that the interior of an angle, uh, of any angle, is also convex. That's also true. Although, it turns out that that comes up slightly less often. Uh, possibly more important, though, uh, though not too difficult to prove, is theorem 27, um, which says that every side of a triangle lies, except for its endpoints, in the interior. of its opposite angle. So the picture here is again something like the following, A, B, C. And so we can look at some segment, so for uh, some side of the triangle. So for instance, we can look at the side B, C. Let me, uh, let me make that a different color. Uh, and so we're claiming that the 
green points on the segment BC, so not the endpoints, but all the points in between, all the interior points of the segment. We could talk about the interior of a segment also, which is just the segment it's except for the endpoints, lies in the interior of its opposite angle. So the opposite angle in the picture here is, is the angle at A, the angle BAC. And so we want to show that this segment lies in the interior of the angle BAC. It's going to turn out to be quite relevant as we move forward that we know how to prove that various points lie in the interiors of angles that we care about. It's going to turn out that doing so will be very, very relevant very often. And one of our best ways of doing that is going to be by using Theorem 27. Uh, but of course, in order to do that, we need to actually prove Theorem 27. I'm not going to write down the uh, a fully detailed proof here, but we'll look at the, um, uh, at the high points here. In order to show that something is in the interior of an angle, you need to show that it lies in the appropriate sides of the lines defined. So, uh, what we could do is something like the following. We could let D be in the segment BC, but not B or C. So, take some point D here. We're trying to show that D lies in the interior of AB of the angle BAC, rather. So we need to show that D lies on the B side of the line AC and the C side of the line AB. And for this, we're going to use theorem 24. So by theorem 24, the, seg uh, the segment BC, except for B, lies on the C side of the line AB. So I can look at the line AB, and I can look at the segment BC, uh, except for B. So all of the points on the segment BC, other than B, lie on the C side of AB. Similarly, by the same theorem, uh, BC minus C lies on the D side of the line AC. So what we've shown is that since D belongs to both of the sets that we've looked at here, we have that D belongs to the C side of AB and the D side of AC. And that's exactly the definition of what it means for D to be in the interior of the angle BAC. So by definition, D lies in the interior of angle BAC. And uh, so that's, uh, that's how we prove that. Uh, and in general, proving that uh, point lies in the interior of an angle will often be the, a matter of applying theorem 27 by showing that it belongs to one of the sides of the triangle. Uh, but not one of the vertices. There's a similar theorem. Similar in statement, though a little bit different in proof. Theorem 28 says that if a point F is in the interior of angle BAC, then the whole ray AF, except for A, uh, lies in the interior of angle BAC. So let's look at 
look at this picture. We've got an angle BAC. We have some point here that lies in between, uh, or lies in the interior, rather, of angle BAC. And then we're looking at the ray that goes from A through F. And the theorem statement is that that whole ray lies in the interior of the angle, other than um, other than A. So uh, let's, uh, let's do this. Let's prove this. So let's let P be in the ray AF uh, except for A. And we want to show that P lies on the B side of AC and the C side of AB. So, um, by theorem 24 again, um, P lies on the F side of the line AC. And so that's using theorem 24 again, looking at the line AC. P, wherever it is, it lies somewhere on this ray, uh, lies on the ray AF, which starts, uh, which has its vertex on the line AC, and therefore all points of the blue ray have to lie on the same side of AC. Similarly, all points on the blue ray have to lie on the same side of AB. So P lies on the F side of AC. Um, but also uh, P lies on the F side of AB. Now we'll use the fact that F is in the interior of the angle. So since F is in the interior of angle BAC, F is on the B side of AC and the C side of AB. Therefore, so let's look at um, each one of these in turn. We have that P lies on the F side of AC and F is on the B side of AC. Now, AC only has two sides. There are only two sides to AC. Uh, and so the first statement is saying that P and F lie on the same side of AC. The second uh, underlined statement says that F and B lie on the same side of AC. But that means that P and B lie on the same side of AC. And similarly, we have that P lies on the F side of AB, and F is on the C side of AB. So again, the line AB only has two sides. And the first blue statement says that P and F lie on the same side of AB. The second blue statement say that F and C lie lie on the same side of AB, and therefore uh, P and C lie on the same side of AB. Therefore, P is in the interior of angle BAC. Uh, and since B was any element of AF other than A, that shows the containment of sets that we wanted at the beginning of the theorem.
So uh, the next result is a little bit complex. It has more points to it than any of the ones that we've seen so far. It looks very technical. Uh, it's surprisingly important though for what for what we do next and it's even going to show up a few more times throughout the course. So uh, want to make sure that we treat it carefully. Theorem 29 uh, surprisingly does not have a name that I know, um, despite the fact that it is sort of vital to uh, what we're going to be doing next. So I'm going to start off by just writing down the statement of it. Uh, given triangle ABC, uh, let F, D, and G be points with B, F, C, A, C, D, and A, F, G. Then G lies in the interior of angle B, C, D. Now, of course, if we just look at this statement here, it's very difficult to parse what's going on. If all we have to look at are are these statements, it's difficult to keep track of what all these different pieces are doing. So this is why many proofs will include diagrams to summarize what's going on, to keep track of all of the um, variables that they've defined, all the points that they've mentioned. And when a theorem doesn't give that to you, it's a good idea to go ahead and sketch it out. If you're working on a problem, uh, be it in homework or uh, out in the in the real world somewhere, and you've got uh, you've got a situation that's just being described to you in words that's hard to visualize. Well, then go ahead and give it a sketch. You need to be careful though to make sure that the actual proof that you write down doesn't depend on your picture. And the reason for that is that pictures can be misleading. Every time I write down. Uh, or I draw some thing, some triangle, I have to make a decision. Am I going to draw an acute triangle? Am I going to draw an oblique triangle? Am I going to draw, uh, what am I going to do? If I'm given a uh, an angle, is it going to be a right angle, an acute angle, an obtuse angle? And you want to make sure that the random decisions you make when you're, when you're drawing stuff don't become things that you rely on when you go to write down your proof. Your proof should follow even without any reference to the diagram. The diagram should only ever be used as a memory aid, never as a proof step. Now, some things that you can do to make sure you don't fall into that trap is try to make sure that when you're drawing things, make them sort of irregular. If you're being told to sketch a triangle, don't make it a right triangle. Don't make it an equilateral triangle. Try and make it have all different size sides and all different um, angles inside. Um, similarly, when you're given an angle to draw, unless you're told it's a right angle, don't draw it as a right angle. Draw it as uh, something else. And if you're concerned that the sketch that you've drawn has misled you some way, try drawing another one that still carries all the same information you were given but makes different choices, uses an oblique angle instead of an acute one, and see whether your reasoning still makes sense as you go through it. So with all that said, let's take a crack at interpreting this set of information about triangles and points and betweenness and so forth. So uh, we're starting with a triangle. So we're given triangle ABC. And I'll randomly do things this way, A, B, C. All right, and then we got F, D, and G are points. All right, and then we're told things about those points. We're told B, F, C. So F has to lie between B and C. So I'll grab it there. Again, try not to put things right in the middle. Try and put them uh, part, way, uh, part way down. Uh, a, C, D. So this means that C is between A and D. So this means that we're actually going to have to continue 
our AC line off to the right somewhere, in this case, and get a new point D, uh, and AFG. So this means that there's some point G where A lies between F and G. Now this means that G is going to be on the line containing A and F. We don't have that sketched out yet, so that's probably a good thing to sketch out. So uh, we've got some line here between uh, containing A and F, and then there's some point G uh, that lies on that line such that F is between A and G. Now the conclusion is that G is in the interior of the angle B, C, D. And now once we've sketched everything else, everything out, the statement looks much more plausible. Now it does look like G is in the interior of angle B, C, D. So now that we understand a little bit more about how this construction's going, let's go ahead and, uh, and work on the proof. All right, so let's see, what do we want to show? I'll do this off to the side. We want to show that G is on the B side of CD, of the line CD, and the D side of the line uh, BC. So this is what we want to show. We've got these two lines, the, the CD line and the BC line, and we want to show that G is on the um, is on the correct sides of those. Uh, so one of those, uh, uh, both of them are fairly quick to do. Uh, so let's temporarily um, make a point that we're looking at the line um, that we're looking at the line BC. So I'll use the red here to indicate which line I'm considering right now. We want to know that G is on the D side of BC. So let's think about what we know about G and, and D with relation to the line BC. So the only thing we know about D is that it's on the line AC such that C is between A and D, and that's the only thing that we know. Now G, we again, the only thing we know about that is that it lies on the line AF, and F is between A and, C and G. Now we do also know that F lies between B and C, so we've got all these betweenness relationships here that we're going to try and take advantage of. So we want to show that G and D are on the same side of the line BC. One way of doing that is to show that they are both on the opposite side of some other singular point. In this case, that point is A. A is what we can use here. So we have that since F belongs to, well, first of all, it belongs to the segment BC because we're told that F is between B and C, uh, but it also belongs to, uh, or actually we want the line BC here, but we also know that F belongs to the segment AG because that was given to us. Since F belongs to the line BC intersect AG, uh, this tells us that A and G are on opposite sides of the line BC. Furthermore, since C is in the intersection of the line BC with the segment AD, A and D are on opposite sides. Of BC. Therefore, G and D are on the same side of 
BC. And we're done. And that's all we needed to do to work out that, uh, well, for, for that half of it, to show that G and D are on the same side of BC, is to show that they're both opposite A, or on the other side of A from BC. All right, let's look at the other one that we wanted to look at. Let's look at the line AC, or, or CD rather, which is also AC. And we want to show that G is on the B side of CD. So let's think again, what do we know about G relative to the line CD, which is also the line AD. And we're gonna use theorem 24 again. G lies on the ray AF, and therefore G is on the F side of the line AC. So we have that G is in the ray AF, and not A, so G is on the F side of the line AC, which is the same as the line CD, which is, uh, which is really what we care about. So G is on the F side of the line CD. We want to show that G is on the B side of the line CD. Well, here's where we can use theorem 24 again. Uh, we have that B lies on this on the ray CF, and therefore B lies on the F side of the line CD. So since B lies on the ray CF, but not C, um, B is on the F side of the line CD. But that means that both G and B are on the F side of the line CD. So that means that G and B are on the same side of the line CD. Thus, G is in the interior of angle B, C, D. One of the things that I appreciate about this proof is that it shows our two most commonly used strategies for showing that, um, that an element lies on a side of a line. Most commonly, you do it either the way we first did it by showing that the two points you care about are both opposite some other point, uh, that uh, you've got this sort of triangular relation from G to A to D, and each time you do that, you're jumping to opposite sides of the line. Or you've got a situation like what we did second, where we show that the two points we care about, G and B, are both on the same side of the line as some third point, in this case, F. So these are two of the most common ways that we go about proving that things lie on the same side of a line or on opposite sides of a line, which turns out to be quite important. Okay, so uh, next we've got a theorem called the crossbar theorem, which is another one which looks quite unsuspicious at first glance, but is a little bit surprising at how challenging it is to make very precise. So theorem 30 is called the crossbar theorem. And it says 
that if D is in the interior of angle BAC, then the ray AD intersects the segment BC at an interior point. So here we're using the convention that the interior of a segment is the segment uh, except the inputs. Again, let's uh, sketch this out. We've got an angle B, A, C, and we're told that we have some point D here, which is in the interior of the angle B, A, C. And then we're told that the ray A, D intersects the segment B, C at an interior point. Right? A, D, and B, C um, are, uh, intersect at a point like this. This is a very intuitive statement, um, but one that, as I say, requires a surprising amount of work to pull off, but is also incredibly useful for things that we're going to uh, want to know about triangles and um, quadrilaterals and so forth as we move on. So let's look at a proof of the crossbar theorem. So uh, uh, it's interesting that we're actually going to start by not using this triangle but by building another one. So let's let D be in the line AC uh, I'm sorry, I want F. I want to follow my notes here. Let's let F be in the line AC such that uh, FAC, so we've got some point F over here. Um, now we can look at the triangle that we make when we go from F, B, F, B, C. So, by the posh postulate, applied to uh, triangle F, B, C, uh, since the line AD intersects uh, the segment FC, uh, segment FC, we have that uh, the line AD intersects either the ray FB, or, uh, or the segment FB, sorry, or the segment BC. Now, of course, we're going to cut this down to the only possibility being intersecting the segment BC, but we're going to uh, take, this, uh, take this down uh, for a moment. Uh, first, though, we're going to show that whatever the point is where the line AD intersects one of these segments, it has to be on the ray AD. So the posh postulate just says that some point along this green line has to intersect either the yellow or the blue segment. And we want to restrict ourselves to say, no, it has to be the side of the line which contains D. It has to be the ray AD which does this intersecting. So our first claim is that the ray AD intersects FB or uh, BC. Uh, so uh, let's suppose not. So a little proof of this claim here. Let's suppose 
not. So uh, that means that there exists some G that lies in the line AD, but not the ray AD, such that uh, G lies in the segment FB, or G lies in the segment BC. Uh, so this G would have to simultaneously be here on the other side of the green line from D, and it would have to be, uh, say, up here on the yellow, and uh, or on the blue here somewhere. Now, obviously, the way I've sketched it out, this is ridiculous, of course, but that's because we're trying to do, we're doing a proof by contradiction. We're assuming something's true, and we're going to show that it can't possibly be true. That it, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, so notice that if G belongs to FB or to BC, uh, then in either case, uh, G is on the B side of the line um, AC. So no matter what, uh, both the yellow segment and the blue segment are segments that uh, have one of their endpoints on the line AC, and the other endpoint is at B, so in either case, G is on the B side of AB. Or, I'm sorry, B side of AC. Uh, but we also know that since D is on the B side of AC, and we know this since D is in the interior of angle BAC. Uh, that means that G and D are on the same side of the line AC. Um, but this is a contradiction. Since in this setup, A belongs to the segment GD. Uh, A is the vertex of the ray, and so if there's some point that's not on the ray, then the vertex of the ray has to be between that point G and D, some point in the ray. So A has to belong to the uh, segment GD, but it also has to belong to the line AC. Well, because A certainly belongs to the line containing AC. And so that means that uh, we have a contradiction. Therefore, the ray AD intersects uh, the segment FB or the segment uh, BC. So that was our first claim. So let me copy down our figure here. And let's get to the next step. So we have shown that the ray AD has to intersect either the yellow uh, segment FB or the blue segment BC. Uh, let me get rid of the... Uh, so, now, next claim. The next claim is that the ray AD does not intersect the segment FB. So that would restrict ourselves to looking, uh, if we can prove this, then we're almost there. Uh, so this uh, ray AD has to intersect either the yellow or the blue. We're claiming that it doesn't intersect the yellow. It doesn't intersect the segment FB. And we can do this by um, 
theorem 24 again. So by theorem 24, all points of the segment FB except for B lie on the F side of the line AB. Furthermore, since D is in the interior of angle BAC, D uh, lies on the C side of the line AB. Hence, so does all of the ray AD except for A. Um, but F and C are on opposite sides of the line AB. And since A does not equal B, we have that the ray AB and the ray FB, or the segment FB, do not intersect. So basically, they're just going in uh, on two different sides of the line AB. So the yellow segment FB goes to the left, as I've drawn it here. The green ray AD goes to the right, as I've drawn it here. And so they're not going to intersect, except possibly on the line where they both start, except that one starts at A, one starts at B, and we know that A and B are not the same. Therefore, these two don't intersect. So uh, that proves the second claim. So wrapping things up. So since AD intersects uh, the segment FB or the segment BC, but we just proved that A, the ray AD intersect the segment FB is empty. This means that the ray AD intersects the segment BC in a point uh, in a point G. Uh, in a point E, sorry. All right, we're almost done. The last thing we have to do is to prove that E has to be an interior point of the segment BC, that it can't be equal to B and it can't be equal to C. Uh, but this is going to um, be fairly straightforward. Um, if E were equal to B, then that means that, well, first of all, we have that D belongs to uh, the ray AE, which is a subset of the line AE, which would be the line AB, which is a contradiction. Since uh, D is on the C side of AB, which means it's not on the line AB itself. Similarly, so by a completely symmetric argument, uh, E does not equal C. So we show that E does not equal B, and similarly, E does not equal C. So therefore, um, the ray AD intersects the ray BC at a point E which is not equal to B or C. So intersects at a point that is an interior point, not one of the endpoints. So uh, there you go. The crossbar theorem is very useful. 
and requires a decent amount of argument. Um, now, that said, um, I always encourage everyone to look at proofs like this, and uh, I look at this proof and I think, eh, it's okay. It could probably be better. There's probably more efficient ways of getting uh, from the beginning to the end, uh, possibly a different strategy or just little optimizations that can be made throughout. I encourage you to go ahead and do this. One of the ways to learn to write proofs is to take a proof that already exists, which is fine, uh, but to improve it. Uh, it's a good strategy for uh, developing your, uh, your skill with writing proofs. We have one more topic to uh, to look at today, uh, which uh, has to do with quadrilaterals. Now, quadrilaterals we're going to work with um, occasionally. It turns out that they are a little bit harder to get your hands on than triangles. Triangles are um, very nicely organized. Uh, in, in a lot of ways. We're going to be able to prove lots of things about triangles. Quadrilaterals are just a little bit more squirrely. Um, but we do want to define them and to give uh, a condition on them that will be relevant for uh, many of the things we do in the future. So, let's take a definition. So, definition 31. So let's let A, B, C, and D be coplanar points, uh, but where no three of which are collinear. So we don't allow any, any three collinear points here. Uh, if the segments A, B, BC, CD, and DA intersect only at their endpoints, then uh, we call the their union, the union AB, union BC, union CD, union DA, the quadrilateral quadrilateral A, B, C, D. Uh, we can talk about the angles of quadrilateral A, B, C, D are the angle ABC, angle BCD, angle CDA, angle DAC. Uh, two sides of quadrilateral ABCD are called adjacent if they share a vertex, an endpoint, I should say. Uh, the diagonals of quadrilateral A, B, C, D are the segments A, C, and B, D. And then finally, uh, the quadrilateral A, B, C, D is called a convex quadrilateral. if every uh, sides, uh, if every one of its sides lies entirely on one side of the opposite uh, side. Uh, so 
I'm using the word side there uh, in two different ways, which is not really uh, ideal. Uh, and so what, uh, what we can do is look at a couple of, a couple of pictures to illustrate what is meant by, by these. So first of all, the definition of quadrilateral is, uh, is the pretty standard one. We want to look at uh, what we get when we take four points. And so here are some examples of quadrilaterals. Uh, here's a, a non-quadrilateral. So uh, this is a non-quadrilateral, and that's because uh, the segments BC and the segment AD uh, intersect at a point other than at their endpoints. So uh, this figure right here, uh, the lower left, is a non-quadrilateral. Both of the figures at the top are quadrilaterals, uh, but one is a convex quadrilateral and one is not. So to check uh, whether or not a quadrilateral is convex, by the definition, what you do is you look at each side of the quadrilateral and you look at its opposite side. In this case, the opposite side is BC. And you look at the line containing BC. And you say, does the segment AD lie entirely on one side of the line containing the segment BC? And the answer is yes here. And then you continue to do that for all the other ones. So you ask, does the segment AB lie entirely on one side of the line CD? Does the segment BC lie entirely on one side of the line AD? And does the segment CD lie entirely on one side of the line AB. And you do that, you go around, you check all four of them. And in this case, we see that the left-hand one is a convex quadrilateral. The one on the right here, the upper right here, is not a convex quadrilateral. And uh, we can see this uh, in a number of different ways, but in particular, we can see this using the side AB. Now, the opposite side to the segment AD is the line BC. So, in this segment, or in this figure, that looks like this. So, notice that in this case, the segment AD does not lie entirely on one side of the line BC. So this is a non-convex quadrilateral. It's still a quadrilateral, but it's not what we're going to call a convex quadrilateral. Now, for these quadrilaterals, we can also sketch out the diagonals, and the diagonals of the convex quadrilaterals uh, are like this. Oh, whoops. Uh, so we can take the two basically opposite corners and connect them up, and, and there are two different ways of doing that. So we've got the segment AC and the segment BD, and we've got the diagonals both for the convex and the non-convex quadrilaterals. You'll notice that in this example, the two diagonals of the convex quadrilateral intersect, and the two diagonals of the non-convex quadrilateral do not intersect. And that's not just an accident. That's going to be true for any convex quadrilateral and any non-convex quadrilateral. And so it gives us an alternative description that we could have even taken as the definition of a convex quadrilateral. And that's theorem. 32, which says that the diagonals of 
of a convex quadrilateral intersect. So if you've got a convex quadrilateral, then its diagonals will intersect. And uh, if the diagonals intersect, Uh, the quadrilateral is convex. So uh, we've got this as an alternative description of what it means for a quadrilateral to be a convex quadrilateral.